All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking some time to join us today, whether you're here in the sanctuary or whether you're meeting with us from your home. So we appreciate you uh, joining us here on this Sunday. It's awesome to have you, and it's great to have all of you up there in the balcony with us. It's wonderful to have you joining us on this first Sunday of Lent. Thank you for taking some time to be here. Um, a, a few things that I'd like to mention this morning um, concerning uh, members within our congregation um, have to do with uh, Reverend Sherry, um, who remains at, at his home, uh, recovering there, uh, spending time there, um, having good days, having days that are somewhat challenging, all of those things that, that come with uh, some um, things that you deal with when, when your health starts to shift a little bit. Um, if he's watching from home and you're there, uh, uh, Sue, with him, uh, we want to, again, from this space, I know you received a lot of birthday cards and calls this week. I want to wish you a very happy 90th birthday. Uh, he celebrated this week, so congratulations uh, to Ken. Yeah. In addition to birthdays, there were also um, anniversaries that were celebrated this week. Don and Leanne Hainert celebrated not 20, not 30, not 40, not 50, not 70 or 80, but 60 years together <laughs> as husband and wife. So Don, if you're watching from your room, or Leanne, if you're watching uh, with someone, congratulations to both of you as well. Yeah, come on. What are you going to do, just give Ken a round of applause when they got 60 years and you all sit there? Uh, Ann Nicholson um, um, is in need of, of your prayers as she continues to recover for, uh, from some recent um, challenges. And also a good friend of mine, Tony Weller, um, your uh, support of him through your prayers is greatly appreciated. The last um, prayer concern or appreciation that I want to mention this morning before a few announcements um, goes to... This fellow right up here in the second row right here. Um, I've known Chris uh, for a lot of years. Um, you've known him for longer than I have because you used to drive a bus when he'd come waddling out there and get on the bus, and you'd say, sit down back there. Is it you again, Wolf Seifer? And he'd say, yes, it is. Um, for those of you that um, had heard me mentioning uh, Chris over the last several weeks, uh, being in the hospital, um, having been here with us, and then having a... Um, a heart procedure, which was pretty challenging. Uh, this is Chris's first Sunday back here with us uh, since that procedure, and so we welcome you back, and we're glad that you're here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to be able to uh, gather around and to be together with people as they um, move through challenges, but to know that you don't have to move through those challenges alone. I understand there's been some meals delivered to your home and things like that. How's the food been? Decent or not so good? A lot of times the food coming out of this congregation isn't good at all, so we just want to make sure. And you're usually getting small portions, probably not very much food, yeah. Getting a lot of vegetarian stuff, a lot of vegan stuff, yeah. Like, where's the meat, right? Thank you all for your support um, of Chris and his family, as well as uh, so many other people within our congregation and community. It's a wonderful to be able to do more than just the formal part of church, but to do church in a way that uh, reaches beyond what we do here on Sunday morning and what we do on the remaining days of the week are a result of what we learn on Sunday mornings together. If you'd like to join us on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we'd love to have you. If you'd like to be a part of any of our grief support groups, uh, we'd love to have you there as well on any of those opportunities. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can speak with me. The uh, midweek Lenten services are scheduled to begin this Wednesday. There will be a 6 o'clock meal and, and then worship at 7. These Wednesday night worship gatherings are about 30 minutes only, okay? They're not, they're not as long. Stop it. I'm going 52 today, Steve. Okay, I'm not, I'm not staying at 48. You want to get up and leave at 48? Go ahead. I'm going 52. <laughs> they're about 30 minutes, and they're kind of designed to be a midweek reflection. Um, there are opportunities for you to participate by helping us on uh, our Wednesday night dinners, and there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Most of those dates are all filled up. 
There was one that was remaining, and it's for this Wednesday. Um, if anyone or a group or a, a group of friends or even a particular group within the church would like to sign up to do something for this Wednesday, please do so. If that remains um, unsigned up for when I leave here today following confirmation, we will make sure there will, there, there will be a dinner, okay? There's a plan in place. If, if there aren't groups and there aren't people that, that are able to do that, we, we will have that dinner, and I'll, I'll put that information out uh, when it um, gets a little bit closer, probably Monday night or Tuesday as a reminder. But please, please join us if, if you would like um, at 6 o'clock. And even if you don't come up for worship, but you want to come and have dinner with everyone, please come and just have dinner with us as well. We'd love to have you. This has been going on. Um, Sandy, where are you at? She's not here today? Okay, she's not here today. She had basketball. Um, this e event for, for one of the students, I'm going to say students, um, of the Zion Nursery Center has been going on um, for uh, the past several weeks. And they had a hopathon in, in his honor to raise money for his memorial. Uh, Mason suffered um, with a disease that ultimately took his life. And they were raising money for the family, and they continued to do so. This is a, there's, been a, there's been a bucket out in the foyer that um, has, has been available for you to make donations. Um, if you'd like to do that, we'd love for you to um, make that donation in, in his, his honor to his memorial. Um, the next slide is, is a little video. It didn't work. Uh, it didn't work, so we don't have the video. Um, there, there was a little video of all the kids downstairs in uh, nursery school doing the hopathon and dancing to music and all that kind of stuff, which I thought would be kind of fun, uh, but uh, the format probably didn't work co correctly for, for what we need. So if you would like to make some sort of donation, Greg, since Sandy isn't here, if anybody has any questions, can they speak with you? you you'll be able to answer any questions they might have. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, that. That would be awesome. Um, again, whatever you can do, however you can help, is greatly appreciated. And um, your, your support of the Zion Nursery School and the Zion Nursery Center and all, all that goes on downstairs throughout the week is a wonderful testament to our uh, continued participation in the community uh, beyond these church walls. So here's the story about this prelude. Um, it's how great thou art, isn't it? It's not? What is it? The old rugged cross, like I said, it is not how great thou art. It is the old rugged cross. And um, it was intended uh, to be uh, shared with the congregation at last Wednesday night's Ash Wednesday gathering. In all of the wisdom that I carry with me, uh, simply because I'm ordained and I get a chance to stand up front here and it's kind of special and all that kind of stuff, I felt that it was appropriate to skip right over the prelude on Ash Wednesday and move into the worship service so you, as members of this gathering and at home, would have the opportunity to hear this beautiful prelude. So, Carol Joe, can you lead us this morning in a wonderful way like you always do? Thank you. 
You are welcome. <laughs> Nicely done. Very well done. Let's stand if you'd like and let's join together in a prayer and then we'll sing together our opening hymn. The prayer uh, that we've chosen for today goes this way. Please join me. Just and merciful God, your church long ago appointed this Lenten season of 40 days for confession and repentance. We pray for humility. Help us to get honest with ourselves and with you and allow us to experience the passion, crucifixion, and resurrection of your Son and our Savior. We pray in his glorious name. Amen. Sound great. Please be seated. Children, I invite you to come forward, spend some time with me. While they're making their way up here, I want to introduce you to another gentleman within our congregation. Tyson, come here a second for me. Come here. Unless you're too sore from yesterday. Come here. Get out of the way. Eliza's coming up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, you can do it. Come on. Come on. Come here. Can you come here? Come on. Look how hard she's working. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Come here. 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 Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Eliza, this is Tyson. Tyson, this is Eliza. Congregation, this just isn't Tyson. This is Tyson, the weekend champion of a wrestling tournament once again. The champ is here. The champ is here. What would you like to say to this congregation? Great speech, great speech, congratulations. Now get out of here. <laughs> Good job. All right. Hello, everyone. How you been? Good? Seems like it's been a long time since I saw you. Yeah. Oh, can you make it over there? Good job. There you go. Just learning. Just getting there. Just getting there. This is um, a particular week that has us entering into a season of the church that has four letters, starts with an L, ends with a T. It was on the screen a little bit ago. Did anybody remember what it was? Yes, sir? Spring. Close. What is it? It's Lent. Yeah, it's Lent. Does anybody know how many days this season lasts approximately? What do you think? 40, goodness gracious, here we are, you're going to, I won't, Steve, you might be out of here in 28 minutes today, because she's, all the answers to the sermon are already taken, yeah, 40 days, and it's a, it's a time in which we're asked to think about some things, and those things are, how is our relationship with God, 
What do we think about when we think about Jesus? And what did Jesus do to prepare himself to do something really, really important? And one of the first things he did was endured some temptations. Has anyone here ever had a temptation? Never had a temptation? Gabe's had a temptation. What's your temptation? To eat all the chocolate and confirmation, along with any jelly we might have for you to take home, right? Yeah, that's right. What's your temptation? What is a temptation? That's a really good question. Let's say, what's your favorite food? You like donuts. Any particular kind of donut? Chocolate donut, coconut, sprinkles. You like sprinkle donuts. So I bring to church with me, and I have sitting right here in front of me, three very large sprinkled donuts. And I put them there, but I tell you, you can't eat them. Will you be tempted to eat them if I left the room like you might sneak a bite? If you don't know, I would notice. You would probably eat them all. <laughs> yeah, that's a temptation to, to have something placed before you that you might choose to do that maybe you know you shouldn't do for something or, or something like that. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah exactly. So what are some of your temptations? Chocolate, sprinkled donuts, what other temptations do you have? Have you ever been tempted to not go to bed when your mother says you should go to bed or your dad says you should go to bed? Do you, when they come in to check on you, do you ever pretend like you're sleeping? Yes, okay, so you've done something like that. Have you ever had uh, some vegetables on your plate and you didn't want to eat them and you put them in your napkin and wadded it all up and when your mom was in another room and she came in, back in the kitchen and you said, I ate everything but they was all wadded up in your napkins? Have you ever done that? This, this children's time just got very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone here like music? Yeah, have you ever been tempted to listen to music when you shouldn't be listening to music? Have you ever listened to music that your parents say you shouldn't listen to, but you listen to anyway? No, you haven't done that one? You haven't done that one yet? Let me show you something I brought with me today. They're right here. What do you think of this official case right here? Look at that. Doesn't that look really official? For, for those of you that are about my age or older or close, what do you think is in here? No. Very, very important things. Can I show the congregation before? Because... What do you think's in here? Money? <laughs> would, would, would everyone here like $5 before you leave? Would everyone here, who here would like for me to give you each $5 before you go? Who'd like $10? Okay, it's not in here, so you're not getting it, okay. What do you think's in here? Yeah. Nope. What do you think? VHS tapes, you're on the right track. What do you think's in there, Brian? Oh, you want me to show you, and then you're going to guess. Hold on now. Hold. Look at this temptation. He just couldn't take it anymore. These are what we used to listen to music on, and it was so valuable, we put it in these leather, pleather type cases to keep everything really safe. Hold on there, big shooter. And they are these cassette tapes. Yeah. They were, what about this one? Yeah, this one um, is, I can't read it. This one is Walt Disney's It's a Small World. Um, this one here is probably the most precious CD of all time. Does everyone know or heard of this person right here? Who do you think it is? It's Elvis Presley. Yep. And these cassette tapes looked like this. And you had to take the cassette 
Yeah, you can take that with your dad and look at it. Just don't, try, try to keep it from getting pulled out of there, okay? Get, <laughs> not that I have something to, well, why would I care? I have nothing to play it in anymore, so it's like, be careful with that. It could be worth a nickel. And we would listen to music on these things. My children would sometimes listen to these stories on their cassette tapes. Temptations are things that help us, sometimes they don't help us, uh, that, that sometimes lead us into thinking things like this are more valuable than other things like the importance of our friends and family, to be a great leader, to learn in church what it means to be a certain type of leader, and that's a servant leader. And so when we think about our temptations, think about sometimes how you're tempted to not do certain things, like to be here on Sunday, at least a couple Sundays out of the month if your parents want you to go, so you can learn to spend time at the kitchen table eating all of your vegetables, Blech. to not eat all three donuts, maybe just half of one, so you stay as healthy as possible, and that we continue to, like Jesus, try to do wonderful things for other people. Can, we help, can you help me to do that? Yep. Can, can one, two, three, can you four help me do the offering? Okay, so let's, let's get ready uh, to do that, but let's do a prayer first, and then we'll be on our way. Thanks for being up here today. You did a great job. Dear God, thank you for helping us to understand what it means to be tempted. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, good job, everyone. I had a message on my phone. My nephew in Omaha sent me a photo, or a little video of Elvis Presley doing Suspicious Minds. <laughs> Thank you, Eli. Now stay awake for the sermon, okay? We're going to read from Matthew uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Um, this uh, particular passage, a lot of you have heard, uh, again, and when we get into these types of seasons and we move through uh, the, the church year uh, and follow Jesus' life, it 
it, it can seem repetitive, but at the same time, the repetitiveness might meet us at a different crossroads in our own lives, and we might hear it different. We might experience it different. Um, and so today, when we read from this particular passage and hear about his temptations, uh, we'll break that down a little bit uh, in some reflections and uh, see how that feels for you. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 reads this way. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the, temple took him, the devil took him to a holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And again he was taken to a very high mountain and showed all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Here ends our reading today on this first Sunday of Lent from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Temptations and discussions around temptations and, and what you might be giving up for Lent uh, abound. Sometimes these are practices that people continue to incorporate into their spiritual disciplines during this season, and, and, and then sometimes they don't. And so if I was to ask you today, those of you that are gathered here, if you've given anything up for Lent, raise your hand if you've decided to give something up for Lent. Three people. Okay. It could be like the children who were just up here, right? I don't know. Should I say it or should I not say it? If you've decided to change something about your lifestyle during this season of Lent, raise your hand. Four hands. If you've decided to just keep things the way they are and coming to church on Sunday morning from 10 to 11 is an obligation, raise your hand. <laughs> Steve Yerkes' his hand first hand. Okay. All right. Well, let me try to be somewhat inspiring, at least. I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do. This first Sunday of Lent, we're presented with this incredible story, and, and, and it is a great story. It's one of those stories that can mean things at different times and at different places to us, depending on how we're feeling. What I mean by that is there might be pieces of the story that resonate with us more deeply than other parts of the story. First of all, this passage with Jesus, um, who's just wet from his baptism, uh, was led out by a spirit into the wilderness, and he embarks on a 40-day fast, and in the midst of that fasting has all kinds of temptations, challenging temptations. 40 days, a much-used number throughout the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. We can remember all sorts of things about the number 40 when we think about Christian and Hebrew scriptures. Noah and his family had some experience in some sort of boat in some sort of part of the world, and they floated, and there was a flood, and they waited it out, waiting for dry land. And something that indicated that this judgment and this transition was over. Forty. The people of Israel wandered for 40 years in the desert. And you can read all about that in Numbers. And for 40 days, 40? 40 days, Moses communed with God on the mountain in Exodus chapter 34. For 40 days, just like Jesus, Elijah was tested in the wilderness as well in 1 Kings. King David ruled over 
his lands and his people for how many years? Forty? Jesus remained on earth for how many days following his resurrection? Thank you for your exuberant energy. I can't hardly stand it up here. Pregnant women are in a gestation period for how many days? Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm not. 40 is a great number. What is the speed limit on Copper Line Road? 40, I think. I don't know. I'm just seeing if you're still with me. Goodness gracious, I've gone one week. What did you two do to them? I don't know what happened. 40. The desert at first seems like a strange place for the spirit to decide that it's the best place for Jesus to discover who he truly was and whose business he was going to be about. But business, but wilderness experiences have a way of stripping everything away from us. Jesus was left with nothing but his identity. He was, as the story tells us, mostly by himself. We don't know of any other people being with him. And after 40 days without food, he was pretty hungry. And this character, this tempter, this enemy came upon him and commenced in a battle with him of these dueling scripture passages. It is written, the tempter would say, and Jesus would counter with, it is also written. And in this interaction, we learn one of the most important lessons about scriptures, I believe. Used out of context, a biblical text can be wielded like a sword. Because scripture is open for interpretation. Each passage can be used or abused. It can even be misleading. And so we need to be diligent about what we understand Scripture to mean and be diligent about where those resources come, up, come from to us to help us understand the intent of that Scripture itself. And so from this story this morning, I want to draw out those three temptations that Jesus was tempted with. And I want to suggest in a manner what we face today. And that first temptation is this, to be relevant. The tempter came and said to Jesus these words, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to be loaves of bread. And Jesus says this, One does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. But Jesus, you're clearly famished you're incredibly hungry. If you are to believe that and you are to understand yourself as being God's son, you'll be able to feed yourself. Take these inanimate objects. Take as many of them as you want. Make them into as many sprinkled donuts as you want them to be and eat them. Be relevant. Be useful. Produce something. Prove yourself. If you want to get anywhere in the world, you have to show results. Be effective. The problem with that attitude and that perspective is that this is the language of an economic system of production and value. If we only focus on results and their effectiveness, the temptation is to value human worth based on what someone can do for the rest of us or what we can do for ourselves. So what does that mean for people who can't work any longer? What does that mean for someone that has a terminal illness? What does that mean for someone who's been paralyzed? What does that mean for an immigrant new to the country? What does it mean for someone without a home? And what does it mean for children? It's not a surprise that God's mandates were always to take care of exactly those vulnerable populations, the ones that are under threat of becoming irrelevant. I believe if we think about it, we know it to be true because a lot of us work like crazy, myself included, to feel relevant and valuable. 
you may have seen the bumper sticker either on a car or online or on some social media posts, Jesus is coming back, look busy. <laughs> Usefulness sometimes can become equated with holiness. The church, I believe, is called for sure to do acts of justice and compassion, and many of you do so. But it's not to prove ourselves, but because we're motivated and we've reflected upon what God's call to us and God's teachings compel us to do for the rest of the world. Henry Nouwen, theologian, spiritual writer, wrote about his experience of moving literally and internally from his identity, okay? His identity. Think about your own identity. What makes you who you are? Who do people know you for who you are? He moved literally and internally from his identity as accomplished professor at Harvard and Yale, a prolific author, to becoming a housemate and a worker at the large community in Canada. If you aren't familiar, this particular community is a community for homes for disabled adults who live together, live together with abled adults, much like the neighborhood home ministries and organization in the St. Louis area. Nowen said that moving into a community where it mattered not one iota who, was, who he was before he got there was a process of painful stripping of his created self. Nowen said that there in that home, he had to face his unadorned self. He went from doing things that proved who he was that proved he was relevant to a society, to a measurement based only on what do you suppose? The authenticity of his love. Nobody cared what he wrote. Nobody cared about his titles. Nobody cared about his prominence. Nobody cared about his fame. They cared about his love and his care. Second lie. Not only should we be relevant, but that we must be amazing. The tempter takes Jesus to a holy city, places him on the pinnacle of the temple, and says to him, If you're God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you won't even dash your foot against a stone. A stone. And Jesus said again, It's written, do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. We hear it all the time. Stand out in the crowd. Be excellent. Be outstanding. Be gifted. Be above average at the very least because heaven knows no one should just be average, right? Those are the mandates of a contemporary life. When I say SAT and ACT, those of you who are recent college graduates or those of you that are preparing to go to college, you know what you're thinking about. You know that's coming, and you know your admission into some schools is going to be important, and your test scores and your availability to have worked in your community and volunteered are all going to be scrutinized. We had a daughter that attended Signature School, had a 3.2 grade point average, and she was not qualified to attend Ball State University because her grade point average wasn't high enough, even though she had a year and a half of college credits due to her time at Signature School. But her GPA just didn't cut it. They were looking for 3.5 and above. In the past 20 years, we've moved from wanting young people to go to college to making applications to those colleges in industry. In this particular book here, Frank writes about, uh, that, that's entitled, Where You Go Is Not Where You'll Be, an Antidote to College Admissions Mania. He articulates very well the madness we've created for kids in their lives. Trying to make them feel like everything that they've done in their lives is amazing. And that they are incredible like we do for ourselves as adults. And I believe it's important. 
But not everyone's going to college, and not everyone's going to be a chemist, and not everyone's going to come up with a cure for cancer. Sometimes people are going to do other things. The pressure that we pass along to our children sometimes to be absolutely excellent goes over and above and causes more pressure and more detriment than good. I had a football player once that came to me. It's been about 10 years now. I was like, man, what's going on? You just don't seem like yourself. He said, I just can't take it anymore. My dad won't stop going over this game film with me. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I'm in the shower. I'm taking a shower, and my dad is sitting on the toilet in the bathroom with me going over game tape and sharing with me what I can do better while I'm taking a shower. This young man wasn't going to play college football, nor did he want to, but his father wanted him to. We're not amazing at everything. We don't have to be. We simply need to figure out what we feel amazing about. And third, we're attempted to believe that we can have it all. Jesus was taken to a high mountain and showed all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor, and he said to them, all of these I will give you. You can have it all if you fall down and you worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. For the truth is, we can't have it all. Not at least without any sort of mental, physical, or spiritual health challenges. We are mortal. We are terminal. The earth's natural resources are limited. Our work and our careers will come to an end. Our children will grow up. And when our children grow up, they'll need us less. If our identity revolves around them, it will change. We will do all that we can. We will work hard, and we do. And someday, everything will change. I had a college professor that would start classes with this statement. It's a lie that you can be anything that you want. Because you can't. I didn't buy into that statement when I was younger, but I do now. And because I believe what he was trying to say, that I understand more clearly now, is that many times we are seeking to accomplish things because we feel pressure to accomplish them for other people, not ourselves. And it's important for us and Lent provides us, the church honors this, to have time for reflective moments, for reflective spiritual disciplines that help us delve into, like the Jesus moment for 40 days in the wilderness, of who we really are. It took a little while for me to realize that I was a decent athlete, but I never was going to be a good enough athlete to play in the NFL. I was not going to be a math instructor. <laughs> I was not going to be a science whiz, nor was I going to be a singer. But I liked leadership. I liked communication. I loved people. And thankfully, I had committed teachers who helped me not to feel badly about what I couldn't do well, but helped me focus on what I could do well. We can question our identity from one day to the next. It's easy to do. And we can let our worth be dependent upon what other people say we should be and do and accomplish. We can constantly measure our self-worth against someone else's standards. Or we can feast on the truth that our core identity cannot be shapen by anyone else, but it's ours to claim. The essence of who you are can never be taken from you. It can be influenced, it can be shifted, it can be transformed, and we can become people we don't even recognize. 
but the essence is there because it's what makes you, you. So please hear this story today and resist the temptation to be relevant. Resist the temptation to be amazing in everything and to seek it all based on the opinions and expectations of others. Base those decisions, base those dreams, base those efforts, put your energy in the areas in which feed you your own inklings, your own passions, and your own drive. In the midst of it all, give thanks to God and just be you. For when we're tested and when we're challenged and when we have those desert-like moments, draw deep into those foundations of what God has instilled deeply within each of your souls and find your energy there. Seek your direction from that point and continue to be the child of God that you were created to be. When we were tested, our closing hymn, would you please stand if you would like. And dear gracious Lord, as we've gathered today, surrounded by people who love us and care for us, surrounded by those who only want the best for us, help us to realize that you have created us in your image, and those images vary greatly. Help us to understand that we don't have to be what anybody else expects us to be, but that we should grow into the people that you have instilled within us to become trusting that loving God and loving neighbor will help us along that path. When we find ourselves in desert moments and challenging times, and when we don't have words to express or even words to share, may these words that we share now together bring us and others comfort. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To all of you gathered here with us and all of you in your homes, Mr. Wolsefer, thank you for making your way back in here with us. It's an honor to worship with you today. May your day be filled with happiness, joy, love, and kindness, and may you share those same experiences with others whenever you have the chance. Our worship here this morning at Zion Lippe United Church of Christ has ended. Let our service now begin.
Amen.